Hi everyone, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Today, the department is rolling out the FY 2024 defense budget request. Joining us today is Deputy Secretary of Defense, Dr. Hicks, and Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Grady. They will each provide remarks and then take a couple of questions. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Hicks. Great, good morning. Thank you, Sabrina, and thank you all for joining us today. I am pleased to be here with the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Grady. To brief you on President Biden's fiscal year 2024 defense budget request. At $842 billion, this is the largest defense budget request in nominal terms that the United States has ever put forward. Thanks to relentless focus and senior leader attention over the last year, it's also the most strategy aligned budget in history, consistent with the 2022 national defense strategy and the president's national security strategy. Nowhere is that alignment more pronounced than in the seriousness with which this budget treats strategic competition with the People's Republic of China. This budget delivers combat credible joint forces that are the most lethal, resilient, survivable, agile, and responsive in the world. It is a force aimed at deterring and if called upon, defeating threats today and tomorrow, even as the threats themselves advance. Our FY24 budget request is a 3.2% increase over FY23 enacted and 13.4% more than FY22 enacted. In all, President Biden is increasing DOD's top line by about $100 billion over FY22 to implement the NDS with urgency and build the right mix of capabilities, whether for tackling the pacing challenge from the People's Republic of China or confronting the acute threat of Russian aggression in Europe, deterring threats from Iran, North Korea, and global terrorist organizations, or ensuring joint force effectiveness in the face of global challenges like climate change and biological threats. All of these are challenges DOD confronts every day. Our goal is to deter because competition does not mean conflict. Still, we must have the combat credibility to win if we must fight. So, first and foremost, this budget is a procurement budget. It puts its thumb on the scale in favor of game-changing capabilities that will deliver not just in the out years, but in the near term too. Our greatest measure of success, and the one we use around here most often, is to make sure the PRC leadership wakes up every day, considers the risks of aggression, and concludes today is not the day. And for them to think that today and every day, between now and 2027, now and 2035, now and 2049, and beyond. This budget has many areas of critical investment, which our briefers will further describe, but I want to highlight several that are especially noteworthy. The first is a series of investments to strengthen our military's so-called kill chains and disrupt adversary kill chains, making it easier for us to see, sense, and shoot, and making it harder for adversaries to do that to us. These investments include a mix of munitions, platforms, communications, data links, and cyber tools, among other capabilities, married with novel operational concepts for how to employ them. Together, they not only strengthen how we project power across long distances and hold key targets at risk, including in highly contested environments, they also afford us the ability to disrupt potential adversaries at the military systems level, ensuring that in conflict, adversary forces will be less than the sum of their parts. In munitions alone, we're investing $30.6 billion in FY24, a nearly 12% increase above FY23 enacted. Compared to the Defense Department's budget request from just five years ago, we're putting nearly 50% more money into munitions. Almost one-third of our munitions dollars are specifically for long-range fires to increase procurement and improve the capability of not only hypersonic missiles, but also our most lethal and survivable subsonic weapons, including those we've been buying at or near maximum capacity for several years. This latest budget expands production capacity even more and procures the maximum amount of munitions that are most relevant for deterring and, if necessary, prevailing over aggression in the Indo-Pacific, such as the Tomahawk cruise missile and its latest maritime strike variant, the extended range joint air to surface standoff missile or the JASM-ER, the long range anti-ship missile or LRASM, 
and the anti-ship capable SM-6 missile, among others. For several of these and more key munitions like air-to-air -air missiles and heavyweight torpedoes, we're looking to make unprecedented use of new multi-year procurement flexibility provided by Congress. This will help us lock in critical investments, getting the most bang for the taxpayer's buck, send industry a clear demand signal, and be even better prepared to respond quickly in future contingencies. When it comes to munitions, make no mistake, we are buying to the limits of the industrial base, even as we are expanding those limits. And we're continuing to cut through red tape and accelerate timelines. Now, to deliver those munitions from all domains, we're also investing in advanced platforms in every military department. At sea, from uncrewed surface and undersea vehicles, to more guided missile destroyers, Virginia-class submarines and guided missile frigates, in the air, from buying more fifth-generation tactical and bomber aircraft augmented by other planes we fly that can release long-range munitions, to ISR platforms, next-generation air dominance, and new collaborative combat aircraft. And on land, from distributed Army ground-based fires to accelerating the Marine Corps' Force Design 2030, fielding the majority of its novel capabilities and force structure in the Indo-Pacific by 2027. And in fact, some are already there. Munitions, platforms, and forces are the most visible parts of any kill chain. Less visible, but no less important, are the enabling capabilities that link them together, making the whole greater than the sum of its parts. And we're investing in those enablers too, with $67.4 billion for cyber, IT, and electronic warfare capabilities. $1.4 billion for Joint All-Domain Command and Control, or JADC2, to maintain our information and decision advantage. JADC2 will make us even better than we already are at joint operations and combat integration and deliver proven enhancements to the warfighter in the next four years. And $33.3 billion for resilient space architectures, capabilities, and enhanced space command and control to keep space safe for military, civilian, and commercial operations. This is the largest DOD space budget ever. It funds diverse constellations for both sensing and communications, while also leveraging America's world-leading commercial space sector. Even as we're strengthening how we sense, see, and shoot in contested environments, this budget also invests in disrupting advanced adversaries' ability to do the same. This includes more funding for missile defense and defeat systems, kinetic and non-kinetic, including capabilities to counter hypersonic weapons. We're continuing to invest in diversified, distributed, and hardened force posture, among many things we're doing to complicate adversary targeting. And we're investing in additional capabilities, which we will only unveil at a time, place, and manner of our choosing. As Secretary Austin has said, we're laser focused on deterring aggression in the Indo-Pacific, sustaining a free and open region, and doing so alongside our friends and allies. Indeed, in the last few months, we've seen great allied and partner developments there, including Tokyo's commitment to double defense spending, the announcement of a new Marine littoral regiment on Okinawa, major force posture initiatives with Australia, and our agreement with the Philippines to nearly double the sites where we cooperate together. To build on that momentum, this budget requests the department's largest Pacific deterrence initiative yet, $9.1 billion for better air basing, new missile warning and tracking architecture, construction for more resilient force posture, homeland defense for Hawaii and Guam, and more collaboration with allies and partners. And the budget reflects how we're continuing to learn from the war in Ukraine and apply those lessons to the Indo-Pacific and other theaters. Another pillar of this budget is its investments in the people who make our military the fiercest and finest force in the world. Taking care of our people begins with ensuring they're trained and equipped. And our readiness is robust. The same is true for retention, with every military service exceeding its goals in 2022. Retention has been outstanding 
partly because the Secretary, the President, and Congress have in recent budgets put a premium on raising military and civilian pay, improving quality of life for service members and military families, and funding training, operations, maintenance, and infrastructure improvements. This budget maintains and builds on those investments with historic pay raises that help us compete for top talent, military and civilian, new funding for universal pre-K at DoDEA schools worldwide, and much more, while continuing our relentless efforts to prevent suicide and end sexual harassment and sexual assault. We can never be complacent, but this is the world's most combat credible force, and the investments in our people alongside our training and equipping investments are a big reason why. A third pillar I'll highlight is how the budget helps us succeed through teamwork. With our network of allies and partners around the world, one of America's unbeatable asymmetric advantages. And with the collective arsenal of democracy and commercial innovation that's been energized by Russia's unprovoked war in Ukraine. Here at home, the budget invests approximately $6 billion in strengthening the defense industrial base and supply chains, including long-term investments in microelectronics, casting and forging, batteries, kinetic capabilities, and critical minerals. As we remodel for the future, we're paying as much attention to the wiring and framing as we are to the finishes. Cyber, space, IT, shipyards, munitions plants, munitions components, barracks, and housing, in all of these areas, we're funding expansions, upgrades, and overhauls, none of which DOD can do alone. The budget also continues to build bridges with America's dynamic innovation ecosystem, with the traditional defense industry and well beyond it, including funding for key technology areas like AI, quantum sensors, and directed energy hastening the pathway from joint concept to experimentation to fielding systems through the Rapid Defense Experimentation Reserve and launching DOD's new Office of Strategic Capital to help attract and scale private cap capital in sectors like semiconductors, advanced materials, and biotech. Beyond our shores, the President's budget aligns with new investments by U.S. allies and partners to strengthen their own security. One example is AUKUS. As you know, today President Biden and Secretary Austin are in San Diego meeting with the leaders of Australia and the United Kingdom to announce the optimal pathway for Australia's acquisition of conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines. Our collaboration through AUKUS, including on submarines and advanced capabilities, is a generational opportunity to strengthen our combined security, boost our defense industrial capability, enhance our ability to deter aggression, and promote our shared goal of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Closer to home, our partnership with the legislative branch is one of the most important and visible manifestations of how we can succeed through teamwork. We appreciate Congress's commitment to providing oversight and checking our work, so we deliver maximum value for both warfighters and taxpayers. We are also grateful as ever for Congress's bipartisan support for DOD and its people in providing for the common defense of our country, our allies and partners, and our interests. We ask Congress to support this budget, and we hope this support will include on-time, full-year appropriations for the U.S. government and our service members, instead of defaulting to continuing resolutions. If you add up the months DOD has been under a CR since 2011, it totals four years' worth of delays delayed new program starts, delayed training, delayed PCS moves. Again, that's four years lost over the last decade plus. To outcompete the PRC, we cannot have one hand tied behind our back for three, four, five, six months of each year. And let me assure you, more money cannot buy back this lost time. I know members of Congress on both sides of the aisle care deeply about America's national security and winning the strategic competition for the 21st century. With this budget and with Congress's support, we're ensuring the U.S. military remains formidable and resilient today, tomorrow, and well into the future. With that, I'll turn to Admiral Grady before we take questions. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. And Madam Secretary, thank you, and thank you for your uh, strong leadership. And on behalf of the Chairman and the Joint Force, 
I welcome everyone here today for this briefing, and it really is an honor and a privilege to represent the soldiers, the sailors, the airmen, the Marines, and the guardians of the Joint Force as we discuss the DOD's fiscal year 24 President's budget request. And we are approaching this request, this fiscal year 24 budget request, with our strategy first and foremost, particularly as it calls to prioritize the pacing threat, the pacing challenge of China. The work of implementing the 2022 National Defense Strategy and the strategic framework that were provided by the 2022 National Military Strategy has served as the basis for last year's budget request and certainly for this year's budget submissions as well, a continuation, if you will. As the NDS directs, our $842 billion uh, budget prioritizes defense of the homeland, deterring strategic attacks, deterring aggression, all while positioning the Joint Force to prevail in conflict if necessary. And with this budget, the Joint Force is truly delivering on the strategic discipline that is at the center of the national military strategy. Over the past several months, Secretary Hicks has skillfully led the department through our budget development, ultimately producing an outcome that the American people can be confident in, an outcome that ensures that the Joint Force remains the most lethal and capable military on the planet an outcome that takes care of our service members and their families, and an outcome that takes action today while also working toward the future. We will continue with FY23's direction to modernize and transform the force into what is needed to deter and, if necessary, to prevail in the 2030s and beyond. This budget resources the department to sustain and strengthen the joint force, and we will maintain our advantage by continuing to invest in resolute, ready, and lethal warriors who are the best led, the best equipped, and the best trained in the world. And as always, I would reiterate what the Secretary said, that the Joint Force is best positioned to maintain and build on our enduring advantages when we receive sufficient, timely, sustained, and predictable funding. And I, too, look forward to partnering with uh, Congress in this endeavor. And as always, it is our task to be responsible stewards of the nation's resources. And so, in a rapidly changing security environment, we know that we must innovate across all domains in the budget development process, and we have worked hard to optimize our investments in areas such as the nuclear enterprise, space and cyber, munitions and precision long-range fires. The budget expands the department's efforts in all domain awareness. It increases resiliency in the defense industrial base and renews our magazine depth so that we are ready whenever we are called. The FY24 budget does this as it continues to invest in key areas that will enable the department to translate the national defense strategy, the national military strategy, and the joint warfighting concept into the operational capabilities required to defer, deter and to win. And most importantly, the FY24 budget request remains in line with our strategic approach and prioritizes China as the pacing challenge while recognizing the acute threat posed by Russia. So again, Madam Secretary, thank you for your leadership and for your words today. And again, it's my distinct pleasure to be here on behalf of the 2.1 million members of the Joint Force. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, with that, we'll turn it uh, over and take a few questions. Tara Kopp, Associate Press. Hi, thank you both. Um, for Admiral Grady, in your requirements role at the department, right. how has China shaped this year's budget? Can you list one or two very specific priorities that are here now um, to face that challenge? And then for you both, um, at this current rate of growth, the Department of Defense budget will top a trillion dollars in just a matter of a few years. How can you explain to the American taxpayer why all of this money is needed and how it's still not enough? Because even in the next couple of weeks, you'll likely see the services go to Congress with unmet needs. So how is it that with this size of a budget, there's still, uh, the services still need so much? I'll go ahead and start sure. with mine, Madam Secretary. Well, thanks. Um, uh, I am the chairman of the Joint Requirements Oversight Committee, the JROC. 
Um, but that really starts with a straight line from strategy all the way down to budget. The requirements piece is just a part of that. And we are clearly focused on PRC as the pacing challenge. But let's go back to the joint warfighting concept, that strategy that devolves from the NSS, the NDS, and the NMS. And if you look at where our investments derive from those requirements or um, uh, 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 are, are manifest, you look at the four key battles for advantage in fires, in command and control, in information advantage, and in contested logistics. So as the deputy mentioned, $11, .11 billion in joint fires as an example, or $30.6 billion for, mun for munitions writ large under the fires um, uh, category. In command and control, um, JADC2 initiatives, where, which was so critical to tying all this together, about $1.4 billion there. Information advantage to include cyber and things like getting to a zero trust framework, framework about $13.5 billion. And, and then within contested logistics, um, $3 billion for 15 KC, uh, one, uh, KC 46 alphas to modernize and recapitalize the air, airborne uh, refueling fleet. All of this derives from the work that the JROC does. Let me address the uh, resources piece. First of all, uh, staying focused really on the 24 budget, uh, we work very hard to make sure we can defend the value the taxpayer and the warfighter is going to get from any dollar that we put in. We do not take for granted or take lightly the trust and confidence of the American people <clears throat> in making sure to support the defense of the nation. At the same time, they have an expectation that there's going to be a defense of their interests. Uh, should the time come that they need to deploy or employ U.S. military forces, and we want to make sure we can deliver that. So that's why we put such emphasis on um, making clear that the that the budget is strategy derived. Um, less important to us is the input part, the top line. That becomes the big issue uh, inside the Washington debate often, but what we really care about is outcome. Can we deliver what we need to at the right time and place for the warfighter and do it in a way that's respectful of what the taxpayers have entrusted to us? Look, I've been around this um, uh, department a long time. There is no such thing as a no-risk budget. We've never been able uh, to have that. We are not a, a nation that lives in a no-risk world. But what we owe and we believe we have delivered here is a very uh, uh, um, uh, robust, ready, capable, combat credible, capable force that can pace against that challenge of the PRC, as I said, today, tomorrow, into the future. That's really our focus. Thank you. Next up, we'll go to Mike Stone Reuters. Thanks, Mike Stone Reuters. Uh, you talk about uh, munitions a bit. In some cases, munitions are going up 20 plus percent for a specific uh, missiles. Uh, NATO has revised up their stockpile targets. Is the United States also going to revise up stockpile targets for various munitions? L let me, uh, we, we assess what we need for ourselves for munitions routinely. We do it against the way in which we think about how we fight for the future and against the real wor world today demands that our combatant commands have to how they would operate with the forces that they have. I won't go into further detail there, and I'll invite the vice chairman to make comments. Our focus on munitions, as I said, is really expanding out um, our munitions supply base, that industrial base. That's both here in the United States and then working alongside allies and partners, and then maxing out production against that. With the multi-year procurement authority that we now are able to uh, use, that Congress gave us in the last NDAA, um, that allows us to put a lot more predictability into and stabilize um, and keep warm, if you will, that production base. We're very
mechanics um, going forward. So amphibious uh, capability is super important. There's a study underway, and we uh, look forward to the results that the Department of Navy brings forward. Great. Thank you all. That concludes our briefing for today. Thank you.